Welcome everybody to our third uh, keynote speaker of the conference, which is Billy Faircloth. Uh, Billy Faircloth is a partner at Kieran Timberlake, a practicing architect, but also a researcher and uh, an academic or a, a, a professor in a number of capacities. And she leads the research group and all the research efforts within Kieran Timberlake, which is an extremely interesting position because in the decade that she's been there, she's been doing a lot of work that puts emphasis in the trust, transdisciplinary, trying to make sure that architects reach out to other industries, to other trades, to academia, and so on. And that spans a number of topics. It has gone from questions of materials in architecture to environmental design, environmental management, and urban ecology, and to even developing software and tools that some of us have known and actually used. I'm, uh, one of the aspects of her group's work that I'm most excited is Tali, because I did a lot of research on life cycle assessment when I was in my master's and we never had a proper CAD tool to look at these issues and I think that Tali is probably still the only thing that you can connect to Beam and to CAD that allows you to do this type of analysis properly. But in addition to that, she is, and I have notes here, uh, she's taught both at Harvard, at Penn, and she's lectured around the world, uh, given keynote speakers on a number of topics from how to introduce and innovate new methods and new tools in architecture as well as questions of her housing and efficient housing in India, and published in topics ranging from energy in buildings all the way to the history of pl plastics in architecture and how to look at how architecture absorbs innovation and new methods through that lens. So I think she represents a fantastic intersection of what we're trying to do here and a role model to what some of us aspires to do in practice as well. So I ask you to help me welcome her and uh, thank you really for coming. All right, thanks for having me. It's um, a pleasure to be back at CIMOD um, and a pleasure to be addressing this audience of uh, modelers, computationalists, simulationalists this year, especially given this topic around um, disciplines and how we work with each other. So the title of my talk is, Wait, What? And it starts with this question, a question to you. How are you organized? So when you're working, to understand a phenomena, to characterize the behavior or nature of something. How do you organize your efforts? And I don't mean your technical efforts. I mean people and how their knowledge relates to other knowledge. So how are you organized? Um, so how many of you model in teams? You all model, most of you model in teams, right? And how many of you model in a team where more than one discipline is represented. Okay. Now, how many of you model in a team where the disciplinary knowledge includes those that are usually unallied with architecture? And here I mean, there's teams where we model, where we're modeling with people, maybe instructional engineering, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, really professions allied with architecture. But how about unallied, biologist, industrial ecologist, urban ecologist? Yeah, do we have some of those here too? Right, and so there's this amazing moment that happens, whether you're modeling in a team where you have folks that are all within the sort of AUC community, or modeling in a team where you have folks from different or disparate backgrounds, where you meet, reach these moments of what we might call, wait, what? How many of you experienced a wait what moment when you're talking with someone from a different background? Okay, so not everyone's hand is up, which means that maybe I need to define what a wait what moment is and I'm gonna do that. All right, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we are organized. We're transdisciplinary. The focus here is on the word disciplinary. Now you may know that there's interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, all of those different flavors of disciplinary really point to how we organize each of, each of our efforts and how we perhaps hold knowledge from one discipline in relationship to another discipline. So in multidisciplinary, for instance, in multidisciplinary research teams, I am allowed to stay in my discipline as an architect, as a designer, 
and maybe I'm referred to as the expert on that discipline. That's the technical definition of multidisciplinary. We look at each other as consultants. Uh, interdisciplinary mixes it up more, says that discipline should be integrated. Transdisciplinary suggests that all of us have knowledge and that we may actually, in fact, transcend each of our disciplines by working on something together. But regardless, the point here is that when we're working in these teams where multiple disciplines are represented, we each choose individually how to treat someone else's knowledge in relationship to our own. And that's part of a wait what moment. We are transdisciplinary. So this is a throwback. What would it, what it be called today? Transformation Tuesday would be the hashtag for this one. Um, this is back in 2012. I haven't showed this slide in a, in a while, but I wanted to give you a glimpse of the links that we went through at Karen Timberlake to begin to understand what it meant to operate in a transdisciplinary way. Really, in this image, you're seeing double, right? You see that they're, everyone's duplicated. And folks here are arranged based on the scales that they work in. So you can see Stephanie Carlisle on the very end, and she's repeated here uh, on this side. Basically, what she's saying is, I work at the lar a large scale and a small scale. And if you look closely, she probably has the biggest range. You can see that one of the ways we were trying to uh, really understand each other, this is 2012 four years uh, after the research group was, was really founded and forming, one of the ways that we begin to understand each other is we understand the range across which we work and the range of knowledge that, uh, the knowledge that we have and the range that it applies to or the scale that it applies to. So we were always, and we have always been trying to work this out. Early on, we were just trying to instantiate it or represent it because at the same time, what we were doing is trying to figure out what kind of vocabulary we could agree on to share our knowledge. Because in our group, we have people with backgrounds <laughs> in urban ecology and chemical physics and materials engineering, along with computer science and sculpture. And often, we just simply had to redefine terminology with each other. But many times, we had to figure out, well, given a certain question, and the scale at which it seems or appears to want to be investigated, can we actually go there? Can we actually go and answer that question? But just in general, Karen Timberlake, as a practice today, I can tell you, is transdisciplinary. We tap into all of the knowledge backgrounds and method backgrounds represented by folks in the research group, but represented broadly by all 100 of us, which means that as a practice, 100 individuals in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, we do projects. We agreed a long time ago that we do projects, we do architectural projects, you know us probably for a lot of architectural projects, but we also do a whole range of other types of projects, as was mentioned in the in intro. We, do hard we develop hardware, we develop software, novel building envelope concepts. Our projects have a tendency to range and scale. And why that is important is because we began to realize that we simply couldn't say that research wasn't a project or proactive work wasn't a project, we actually had to establish research as a project, which meant that for us, research was part of our design philosophy and not something that's nice to have, that you do at night, under the cover of darkness, or on the weekends. It's something that you do as part of the design process, right? And it plays, it, out, it plays itself out in a myriad of ways. So for a given project like 181 Mercer Street for NYU, there's a certain kind of research that we do through this transdisciplinary focus um, that plays itself out across all phases of the design process, where we have conducted a series of analyses. And the way we capture these analyses um, often indicate the degree to which we're experimenting with something, uh, the degree to which we're trying on a new workflow, or the degree to which we're asking a question and trying to answer that question to create actual information to make a decision. So if you look closely at all of these uh, examples up here, you'll find that some of them relate to distributing weather stations on a site to understand when. Some of them relate to um, these, a kind of experimentation with uh, viewing, um, data analysis in VR. Some of them will relate to really trying to get at the 
um, materials science or materials engineering level understanding of ceramic frit. At the same time, many of these types of investigations give rise to new ideas while we're always constantly thinking and trying to leverage our curiosity. So we hold two types of research projects in one sense. Research that we do on a day-by-day -day basis, but also research that we set up as projects where we want to investigate something. Right? So in this, in this instance, uh, we're investigating simply architecture and environment. It's a seasonal study. It's multi-scalar, multi-method design and modeling approach. Um, we talked about this project last year at CIMOD. It's a project that we did with the Center for Information Technology and Architecture. And it's just simply using a full-scale material prototype to continuously measure and describe the actual thermal behavior. We're using a mechanistic model to simulate, calibrate, and validate the thermal behavior of the same system digitally. And then we're going to use the calibrated and validated model as a design platform to author new surface geometries and predict heat transfer profiles. So a proactive project like this allows us to leverage hunches or to investigate certain phenomena more deeply. And this one really, the system boundary is really clear. It was about that facade in its environment and the relationship between physical things and digital things. Other types of proactive projects require partnerships. This one's with Jefferson University Hospital, and it's really about people and architecture. It's a longitudinal study. There's another multi-method approach here where we're executing a tablet-based survey, and we're looking at point in time and path of both patients and doctors as they interact with each other and with their environment. And then another similar, another example of proactive work um, really, um, it, this one's a more recent one where we're trying to understand uh, and trying to solve or put in place an intervention, an immediate intervention in an unprecedented health crisis in Ulaanbaatar, the coldest city and the most polluted city uh, on our planet, um, where they're experiencing um, air quality levels exceeding 900. That's really stressing. Uh, in this instance, it's a slightly different study for us because the stakes are high, higher than we've ever imagined because the requirement is not, you know, the, it, we're, we don't have the luxury of doing three seasons or four years of data collection. The question is here is whether or not we can characterize the thermal performance with UPenn of the GARE. And then uh, can we begin to understand a series of interventions and can we deploy them, those interventions, and test them next season, next, which, is, which would be this coming winter? So we establish research as a project, both related to our architectural projects and proactively. And we identify questions that relate to the things we're interested in that are expression of our design philosophy. I say this because I know that every research group has established an interest, a focus, and they often are looking at those questions that are of most interest to them. Our transdisciplinary bent has allowed us to mature a whole range of different techniques and methods. So often and early on, we were testing a whole range of ways of measuring things and then going to the extent of actually developing our own low-cost, high-density sensor network. But we've also appreciated a robust uh, way of surveying on-site conditions, whether it's plants in space or people in space, all connected back to uh, one of our members' uh, real training in ethnographic field studies and anthropology, that would be Stephanie Carlo. We also develop a whole range of bespoke models and simulation. Um, sometimes we're using commercially available off-the-shelf tools, but often the models that we create are like the models that you create connected to a very, very specific question. And we use prototyping quite a bit. Sometimes it look like, looks like prototypes. Sometimes there's clear evaluative criteria. And sometimes, honestly, um, there's not. There's not clear evaluative criteria. But um, we always try to have uh, that discussion about what we're seeing and what we need to do next. So these methods and techniques are, are quite important, and we imagine continuing to involve, the, evolve these methods and techniques, but we also imagine trying to capture, communicate, 
and share our results. So <coughs> we share them internally through a whole range of different types of infrastructure. And this is really how we begin to communicate to each other and how we begin to refine vocabulary. Uh, but we share our projects externally. We seek peer review. We seek commendation. And yes, we seek to distribute our tools. This transformation of our practice hasn't happened overnight. The goal to create a research center practice was there from the very beginning, rooted in James Timberlake and Steve Kieran's design philosophy. And we've been working more and more on different generations or manifestations of this research center design practice, but has required incredibly strategic decisions at the firm level, like deciding to fund, to self-fund proactive research, saying we can't quite wait to be able to get funding to do this. There's actually things we want to know now and need to know now that we believe have value, value to our clients and value to architecture. Um, or deciding to invest in an ISO certified design research process or design process in general. Uh, we, we went after getting ISO certified because we simply wanted to map out upwards of 40 plus processes that really are the infrastructure for what we do and the exchanges we have between all 100 of us on a daily basis. Uh, we codified a research query process, just simply means that we made an explicit decision to capture our research questions, our research methods, our results, and share them internally. And more recently, we've formalized a design computation platform. And in fact, Christopher Connick is somewhere here in the audience. And he is, our, it, he is KT's design computation director who can answer many nuances of the projects that I'm going to be showing you. And then also formalize a collective intelligence-based staffing model, which gets back to the transdisciplinarity bit. So that means that every project, architectural project, at Kieran Timberlake starts with, again, this assumption that we are going to ask questions, that we are going to leverage our curiosity. So a project team yes, as a project manager, and yes, you could find probably a project architect, and you can find a whole range of staff who have backgrounds in architecture, but you can also find people staffed to that project from the research group, someone who's a coordinating researcher, who can tap deeply into all these methods. And then you will also find someone who is from our communications group. We also began to realize that not only are we interested in architecture and research, but communications is actually the third leg of the school, stool, and we also need to be able to share the narrative of our projects and capture that narrative as we design. So these are our milestones, but really what it is that, uh, that is so essential to this entire process is our willingness to say that describing the behavior and nature of something matters. We could not do any of our work without placing value on that. Um, I will say that our milestones evidence the degree to which we believe that has incredibly high value. But really what we've done is we've given people the agency to describe the distinctive nature or features of, to specify, identify qualities of, and classify. Essentially, we've given people the agency to characterize. So what's interesting, of course, is that we've said that describing is essential. Describing how something behaves is essential to what we do as architects. So in many ways, as I watch your presentations, I realize there's this whole group, this whole community of, of folks that are willing to go there, that are willing to be the describers of the behavior of architecture. And that's an interesting place to be. It's an interesting space to be in. Um, because what we know and, and what, we can, what we know about this process is that, yeah, there's methods to do it, but often um, it's kind of messy. And there's whole ways that we approach these different processes. But uh, when you begin to think about characterization, if you just sort of step back and you begin to ask yourself, because many of you model with disciplines, you begin to ask yourself, just how far are we willing to go? How many disciplines are we willing to involve? If you just step back and think about characterization, you realize that all disciplines, all disciplines have methods to describe the nature of something. And all disciplines operate across different scales, which leaves a lot of room 
for us to begin thinking about the types of models we use and how far we're willing to go, how far are we willing to investigate the overlaps between other disciplines' methods and our methods in order to get at something that has yet to be described or yet to be understood. And that's precisely what's so wonderful about Simald. We see this happening again and again in your work, where you're trying to get at something that has yet to be described or understood. Our models have a tendency in architecture to be mostly descriptive, but in this room, we have folks who are working on the predictive and the projective, and really trying to get at the qualities and methods around predictive and projective models. There's a whole range of different modeling practices associated with different disciplines, different types of models that do exactly the same thing. And what's so interesting is that, of course, if there's models, then there's also methods to collect data. And all these methods vary across disciplines. And as we analyze and interpret, we know that through modeling, collecting data, analyzing, interpreting data, we have a whole range of different criteria across disciplines for certainty. Right? So we heard Frieda Augenberg yesterday talk about this issue of uncertainty in our modeling practices. And that's a really interesting point, and we all know it, we all feel it. Um, when, are, when are we or how are we going to declare what is acceptable to our profession? But when you back out, no matter whose model it is, whose discipline it is, every model has a goal, an intention. So we're left, as designers, when we look at the incredible, what I hope is a sort of glimpse of an, an incredible um, say, study in modeling and methods and a question about uh, which ones we should be adopting and what will allow us to get at that next thing we need to describe because there's so many challenges we're facing. Um, we have to ask these questions. Who? Who has the opportunity, the pleasure, the right to characterize aspects of a system? Why and how? And in what ways does the process of characterization inform architecture? And how do designers engage the process of char characterization, when and why? The more I work across disciplines, the more I am convinced that design is one method among many methods. But I'm also convinced that out there is a model verse and a methods first, and that we are not alone, and that we should be reaching out to the model verse and the methods verse. So wait what? Why wait what? What I want to do next is share with you six snapshots of projects. But I want to explain to you why this title. I wish I had recorded all of the conversations that we've had over the last 11 years when we're debating what goes into a model. And the debates happen across disciplines. Now, if you look at the Urban, Urban Dictionary's definition of wait what, it's sort of the emphasis is on the wait, right? Wait, what? Right? There's this wait as if I'm not listening. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the use of the expression wait what in that way. I'm talking about a much more intentive use of the term wait what, where it's quick. Wait what? Where you hear something and you realize that what you've just heard challenges or slams up against your knowledge of a particular thing in such a new and interesting way, it opens up a new pathway for you. I picked this phrase because as I rifled back through all of our conversations, there's a whole range of instances this phrase is uttered along with other phrases where I've seen and observed or been part of this happening. A new pathway opens, a new modeling pathway opens. And there are lessons after lessons learned about operating across disciplines when this happens. So you might be aware that there's a book. There's, I think there's a YouTube channel called Wait What? And there's a book uh, called Wait What? Um, by James E. Ryan, who's the dean of uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Education. They're two very different things. Um, I like uh, Dean Ryan's definition of wait what a little bit better. He says this, uh, wait what is the root of all understanding. Um, it's a, actually a very effective way of asking for clarification. And that's precisely what has happened. I backed into 
uh, understanding wait what ur in the Urban Dictionary and through a much more studied or scholarly approach, just simply by realizing that that's exactly what we were doing. So I'm going to show you glimpses of six projects. Sometimes the projects are explicitly modeling projects. I actually, I, it was hard to choose. And in many instances, there's, wait, there's multiple wait what moments. I had to choose one. And they're all associated uh, with a whole range of different challenges we face in our modeling practices. The first one um, is quite, quite simple and quite direct. Um, this is Dilworth Park. Uh, Dilworth Park is, anybody been to Dilworth Park? Dilworth Park, yeah, a couple of folks. Um, center city, center, literally center city, the center of the city, the center of William Penn's uh, formation of the city, uh, Philadelphia. And um, this park previously looked like the image on the left. It, it inhibited uh, flow across the park. It wasn't a, a very welcoming or very well-used or well-loved living room for the city of Philadelphia. Uh, at the same time, there was a whole range of um, trans, a, a big, let's just say it's a huge knot of transit lines that run right underneath this site. We have a small subway system and trolley system in Philadelphia, but if you were to visit this site and this intersection point, you would think it was huge because they all meet and converge here. So there are many reasons to transform this space. Okay. This was uh, 2010 when we were doing this work. The park was completed in 2014, and the space has essentially been transformed. Um, both day and night as this vibrant urban open space for all Philadelphians. But the wait what moment came at some point in 2010 when we were trying to understand exactly what it would mean to transform this space into an open space, one where we would expect people to inhabit the space year round. We were particularly interested in the wind on the site. So the wind on the site, we knew, uh, had heard, and we, we knew could possibly be problematic. You saw that the previous plaza was depressed, bringing something up to grade level. We were really curious about that. We're curious about that for a number of reasons. You can imagine had a lot to do with how comfortable people would be there uh, in both the winter and in the summer. And we decided, OK, well, we don't have access to on-site uh, on weather station. Uh, we know that the airport information is kind of iffy, um, or is it? And so let's just go ahead and do a really quick CFD analysis. Um, so that's what we did. We're focusing, you can see the center of the site. You can see that it uh, has a lot of uh, building context around it. And what we really wanted to do is just simply understand um, the site in that context. What you can't quite see is that when the city was um, planned, well, you can see how the city was planned. Four squares, the center site is the center of the city or the center grid. It was actually the original pump house, William Penn's pump house. But you can also see this big diagonal going out to the Philadelphia Museum. Um, interestingly, that diagonal corresponds to the absolute direct bearing of wind in the winter. So that entire shoot becomes uh, this really interesting challenge <laughs> to walk in a certain direction, right? And we did this model in Invamet 3.0. We did this model, and it was a crazy model. We were like, okay, how do we get this data? We were just desperate. We wanted to do this kind of data sketch. And we, you know, one night we like built up the model. If you remember, you know, the modeling here requires you to build the context in really simple ways by using this kind of pixel, or almost like a voxel method. You're building up this, like, you're saying what the height of the buildings are, uh, the orientation, you're using a TMY file. We had, um, figured out that the, the bearing um, matched the, the bearing of the winter wind, which we were eventually interested in studying, matched the bearing uh, or matched the um, airport data. So we felt okay. 
and we did this model. And it ran overnight, and it took way too long to run. And I came in the next morning, and I looked at the model, and I immediately said, that's not right. There's something wrong with this image that's not right. Uh, and it turned out there were errors in the input method, uh, errors in the way that the actual site was oriented. Um, you can see that the grid is slightly off uh, true north. Um, there, were, there were a whole series of errors, and then there were all these like, exceptions to be made. Um, the, uh, the analysis plane couldn't be lowered to the height that we wanted, so it wasn't at the pedestrian level, it was actually up much higher, all these sort of errors. But I looked at it immediately and knew it wasn't right. And that was because for the preceding nearly, uh, I don't know, 150 days, I had been walking from my house in Bella Vista in South Philly up through Philadelphia, and you can see the center of the city there, right through that plaza. And so the, the observation from the actual model said, whoa, we've got a problem. It is windy on this site. This is going to be an issue. So we're going to have to really figure out, maybe there's some design drivers here to really think through thermal comfort on this site. Wind, wind uh, connected to uh, certain events of rain, connected to certain temperatures, or conversely in the summer, we're, we're going to have to do something. But my own walks through the city told me that the plaza didn't look like that at all. It didn't feel like that at all. In fact, you know, the hunch, of course, was that all this wind channels down the parkway and just unleashes itself right into the park or the plaza. But that's actually not what I experienced, not what was happening. And more importantly, what I began to realize is that every time I walked that path, I used my umbrella. I used my umbrella not because it was raining, but because it was so windy. I was using the umbrella to shield myself from the wind. So using the umbrella as a probe allowed me to actually begin to map unknowingly in my brain where the wind direction was coming from, where there were vortices, where I could account for having my umbrella turned in inside out, so to speak. And that began us, th this entire conversation with Roderick Bates, whose background is environmental management. The entire conversation between Rod and I um, began a long, long, and to this day, study into the relationship between ground truth and what you experience, actually experience on the site, and how our lived out bodily experiences are incredibly important to translating knowledge across disciplines. It also launched an entire series of studies and new practices for us into uh, collecting and doing deep analysis on microclimates on sites. And it translated into studies like this, where uh, fast, or, yeah, fast forward several years, um, this would be 2016, so six years later, um, translated into practices where we're actually going into sites, distributing weather stations, um, asking questions about the actual wind on the site, looking at the information collected on the site in relationship to the airport data, which tells us a very, very different story. And that really began, uh, th these types of practices um, are practices that began to help us set up and establish goals at the outset of every project. We ask questions about microclimate and collecting data on sites at the outset of every project. So wait, what do you mean the model inputs are incorrect. Regardless if you're modeling across disciplines or not, we know that modeling practices are technical and social. So it wasn't only about the technical aspects of CFD analysis. We had to talk it through. You talk things through on a daily basis with your modeling par partners. There's a social aspect to everything that we do when it comes to the type of work that we do. We also know that modeling practices should value explicit and tacit knowledge. I, I had to stop back and think, what would I have done if I simply accepted the results of that model as being more valid than my own experience? Right? So there's something there about really valuing these two types of knowledge 
And then when we work across disciplines, challenging each other with these two types of knowledge. I would say on a daily basis in our group, the tacit, lived out, bodily experiences that we have with certain phenomena are one of, the, are, are, it's, it's a group of, of experiences that we use to communicate with each other when we don't quite understand someone else's knowledge domain. Okay, so I might not get through all these projects, which is totally okay, it's kind of how I set this up, um, but I'm going to get through as many as I can. Uh, so the second project uh, is Green Roof Vegetation Study. And here we were going on site to all of our previous green roofs. And we were asking really a, a simple question about the, how, how essentially the contribution of the vegetation to the performance of the building, but really how the vegetation had changed over time. We had made a series of observations just spying one of our former projects uh, which is the, the Yale, um, Yale University project, we noticed the amount of biogrowth on that roof and we just simply asked, what's going on up there? Why, why I'm sorry, biomass. Why so much biomass on that, that roof? Um, isn't it kind of interesting that if we un really understood what was there and how it changed over time, wouldn't that help us understand something more about the performance of green roofs? We did this study, we started the study in 2012 and ran it through to 2014. But we are also interested in the long-term performance and dynamics of green roof vegetation in general, which got us to the wait what moment. What does the vegetation is dynamic mean? So in our group, we have folks who have backgrounds in urban ecology and forestry. And of course, vegetation is dynamic. Of course it is. It changes. There's a whole universe of seed dispersal mechanisms out there that are super interesting. But we wanted to understand, really, how dynamic as a reflection back on the decisions we make when we're designing green roofs. And we were able to do that through a, a, a method of um, analyzing the roof, where we simply gridded the roof off in a series of quadrants, and we began to do species count and species ID per quadrant we were able to come up with a series of snapshots of the roof over time. So 2006, we planted 11 species on this one roof at Yale University. And we planted them in this wonderful swoopy pattern. And then by 2011, 2012, 2013, of course, we don't know what happened between 2006 and 2011, but we almost can interpolate that. Uh, we began to see that the species composition changes over time and that there's a whole range of mechanisms that as architects we didn't understand. But when, when two ecologists go onto that roof, they began to really study the vegetation and they began to see what is there these knowledge sets, sets can be used to give us some insights into the dispersal, seed dispersal mechanisms uh, on the roof. So for instance, the ruderal species are those species that are the ones that have a tendency to show up first on a disturbed site. They, they showed up for sure, maybe through wind and through bird disbursement. But I think more importantly, what we began to learn as Stephanie and Max took us through this process was that composition or the way that you design a green roof is newly defined. They challenged us to think about designing the roof over time. They also were able to run a whole series of analyses that allowed us to understand species density, or which is the, the basically the number and distribution and evenness of dis distribution of different species or the presence of the species or the percent of cover. Uh, they allowed us to understand all of those or run, run all of those indices, but then some simultaneously reflected back on some of our other analysis methods, like solar analysis methods, um, as well as the detailing of the roof to show that there was this amazing correlation between the hydrological, or let's just say the drainage plane of the roof and the species diversity and the species 
uh, the, the number of species in the um, percent cover. So in other words, the form, the actual shape of slope had an inner relationship to how the species thrived on that roof and the amount of, of biomass on this particular roof. And that started an entire conversation between urban ecologists, architects, about what we should do when we actually go to design a green roof. Where should we begin? Should we start at the very outset, understanding that this is an opportunity to think about how the roof would change over time? Now, I speak about um, members of the research group as if they have a single discipline. But one thing that I wanted to um, be really clear about, actually, is that you know, at the outset, we didn't know who would join Karen Timberlake. We didn't know who would join the research group. We knew exactly which modes or methods we wanted uh, working in the research group. But interestingly enough, those folks, the folks I keep mentioning, are individuals who have backgrounds in urban ecology, anthropology, and architecture, or chemical physics and architecture. Many of them, many of them right now today, have multiple degrees, physics, or industrial ecology and architecture. They have multiple degrees, so they're actually able to help translate or put these things together. They put themselves in this mode of translator. So modeling across disciplines, when you model across disciplines, it does this amazing thing for designers. It challenges the origin of our inputs. Often what we're thinking about in the green roof is that it's this green layer uh, we render it green. We don't think about it as a series of biotic components that are going to change over time. We expanded ent an entire variable, or nuanced an entire variable of the design process simply by doing this study. So uh, vegetation, as you can see, is, is probably something that um, we are, after that study, we were, we were absolutely in a position to focus on. And, um, we, of course, um, continued to have a, discu study not, a discussion not only about green roof vegetation, but also about trees. And this came um, up mainly because of something we, let's just say, um, it was a moment um, where a data set surprised us. So I'll just show this again back here. Um, building we're working on at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. Composite image, of course. Trees, <laughs> leaf presence, leaf absence. What do you think is going to happen? Anyone want to take a guess? This is an existing building. It's going to be a deep retrofit. It's called the, it, it's concerned with energy performance. What do you think? Trees, yes. Shade is exactly what we found. So we were running an experiment. We weren't there to find shade. We were running an experiment. We, the building had no documentation. Uh, it was, the roof was near, nearly, uh, had nearly caved in. It was going, again, a deep retrofit. We had an opportunity to go in and put our sensor network in to really understand the thermal diffusivity of the wall. That's all we wanted to understand. At the same time, researchers at Penn State were putting propane tanks, distributing them throughout the space, heating the building up to cool it down. So we were collecting an entire data set over time just to look at dissipation, that just dissipation during a certain season. But our sensors stayed in the wall. And what we began to understand was, if you look at the blue line, that's the south wall. That wall has a series of mature trees in, tr in front of it at a certain increment that are just shading the wall. And so we began to see, wow, that's a significant drop in temperature in the south wall when the leaves come on. Interesting. And that began an entire series over, and this is still going on, this debate is still happening, I have to tell you. But this has begun, it began, a, a, let's say, a series of studies to try to account for the contribution of trees in our energy models. And to actually expand, this, what we're doing there is expanding the system boundary of the model. 
So in this instance, you know, we, we have gone on site and um, gotten better at understanding specific species of trees, of course. Uh, we have foresters in our group, or people trained in forestry in a group, so we've gone on site, we've used actual techniques to characterize trees that are on site, um, using our own in-house modeling software that we developed. We come up with a method of entering uh, the species representation into our models and accounting for those trees as occlusions in our models in order to get a better or higher resolution or a higher fidelity understanding of insulation on that actual envelope. We've tested a whole range of different ways from spherical camera cameras to using simple disometers to understand the tree canopy, but also to understand what's called uh, the gap fraction of a tree, which is simply the, uh, the space between leaves that allows light to actually come through. We've worked with different types of data sets. Um, in this instance, uh, at Tulane, we had 11 species, we characterized, or 11 trees, we characterized three of them. Um, at University of Washington, we had a tree database of over 10,000 uh, trees. And here we simply needed four factors, location, height, crown volume, and shading coefficient. And it turns out the shading coefficient is actually the most debated within the urban ecology and forestry realm. Um, and it's the hardest thing to actually get at for individual trees with, with different, of, of different species. Um, but essentially, what we've done is we've developed a new practice of modeling with trees and understanding shading. So in this instance, modeling across disciplines has required us to debate accepted methods of abstraction uh, in, within our own discipline. All right, I'm gonna do one. I think I have time for one more. Do I have time for one more? Uh, we have to choose between that or taking questions. Okay, but I'll leave it up to you. all right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish um, by saying a couple of things. And I'm just going to, uh, let's see. Sorry. <coughs> um, I want to just get to the point, or, or actually conclude with the series of wait what moments. And, and trust me, um, the projects I didn't show would have gone on to get, uh, get into um, other um, aspects of working across um, groups um, from um, realizing that when you work tr in a transdisciplinary manner, sometimes you're positioned to be an advocate, a new advocate within your own profession for a new modeling practice, which we heard uh, a lot about uh, from your presentations. But ultimately, um, really the, the way that uh, you might think about um, working across disciplines is you might begin to think about all of the factors that conspire to create architecture and how much we don't actually know, but also our capacity to go out and to ask and to build teams and to form teams to really dig into those variables that we believe matter to the things that we're trying to solve. So these wait what moments, uh, they've revealed the productive interface between disciplines. You know, many of these moments are related to methods of measurement, data collection, um, especially related to the coarseness and granularity of data interpretation, but also related to this issue of abstraction. And through debate, through really intense debate, we found a lot of opportunities to understand the interface between disciplines. Right at the interface between disciplines is a lot of opportunity to explore new realms within architecture. They're also about model handshakes, where one discipline's quantitative output serves as an input for another model. We see this again and again and again. There's significant overlaps between one discipline's modeling methods and, a, and another discipline's modeling methods. They're both characterizing perhaps a tree, but doing it in completely different ways. So we have to pay attention to modeling handshakes. Many of the moments insist that where and when matter, meaning that you will see in our work, there's this intense interest in things being spatially and temporally explicit. Understanding where things happen in space is important as much as how they change over time. We've also found that 
when we have these discussions about modeling, and especially when we're looking at the data and we're trying to interpret it, that more often than not, because we are engaging this practice inside architecture, we're challenging methods of representation bound to individual disciplines. So in the Green Roof Project, for instance, that information about species presence and number would have never been mapped in that way. That was actually a new method of, of visualization that was written up in a peer-reviewed paper and a new method of survey. Uh, and those ma the mapping of the species was an important way of talking back to a discipline and saying, hey, we can we don't only have to use statistical methods, but we actually can use mapping in a really, as a really important tool to talk across disciplines. And many of these efforts actually uh, attempt to empower individuals, especially those who don't normally have access to certain modeling techniques, um, because they allow us to ask a broader range of questions. And that would be uh, associated, especially for those of you who have used tally that wait what moment there included us um, being asked mostly by the profession, wait, what are you doing allowing architects to model uh, life cycle impacts over time? Really what this points to is incredible opportunity to rethink the system boundaries of our models. So modeling across disciplines has gotten to this, us to this point where we have enough insight into the efficacy of our, our transdisciplinary practice to really begin to go after the system boundaries and to do it in such a way that hopefully will reflect back on ultimately the goals that we have for architecture. All right, so I'm gonna stop there. I've got five minutes, I think, for questions. Mine is very quick. Yeah. What would you do if you or nobody you knew was walking with their umbrella through the school? What would I have done? What would you, yeah, what would I, 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 I have asked myself that question, Angela, so many times. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I mean, clearly, clearly we were doing a, C, uh, a CFD. We were doing basically a really quick sketch. Um, fortunately, I was. Other questions for me? Um, really fantastic talk. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, my question is a little bit about going back to the organizational aspect of, yeah. of how you opened. Um, there's sort of two parts. One is, you know, Joey Ito always talks about antidisciplinary. I know, I was gonna mention antidisciplinary, <laughs> but I actually think it's pretty close to transdisciplinary. Okay, so that was question yeah. one. Question two is, you know, in the philosophy of the firm, I mean, there is a, agreement amongst you all to self-invest. Yes. Um, but you guys are doing a lot of work. I mean, you're doing a lot of work that you know, costs time and money. Yes. Um, and so it, it's a question of how are you getting all that done, in a sense? It's, it's, it's part business, but also part how you make research as a project, like who's paying for it, and, and, right. and that kind of um, mechanics of it. Because yeah. you are doing it, you're sharing it, you're we are. making money off of it. and. All of that. Yeah. I mean, um, I, at one point, and, and, and I, yeah, go ahead. Of, part two of that is also, you're also employing people that are non-traditional. Yes. Um, which may cost different amounts of money or. That's right. That's right. So um, at some point, I'm going to stop giving lectures and just do a whiteboard session on business models <laughs> for research. But I haven't done that yet. Um, it's, a, it's part cultural, right? So one of the milestones I didn't read off was a commitment to invest 10% of our profits into research. And that was in 2003. That was the, you know, answering the question, well, we're, we're going to have to take some risk to pay for what we believe is the right thing to do for our practice. At this point in time, it's not a, there's never a question about how can we afford research this year? Can we actually afford it? That's not the question. It, this entire enterprise has evolved into a culture where it's simply, how can we afford not to research? Right. And so it's integrated, it's become more and more integrated into our design process to such a degree that we can't separate it out. But, but did that take more than just you as Absolutely. consistent on that? Absolutely. I mean, it, James Timberlake and Steve Karen are the original 
researchers at Karen Timberlake, this is part of the design philosophy. They founded this practice. So with that, it's integrated into design philosophy, right? And that is, um, that's very different, I would say, than um, a charge to come in and make research a service. Right? It's, it's, it's actually, uh, it actually means that um, the stakes are higher, that's essential to what we do. It's also essential to how much uh, we like what we do, right? And how much we agree that all 100 of us can leverage our curiosity. It's part of the culture as well. So, yeah, I'm, I'm totally willing to take questions uh, outside or, yeah. do we have more time? Yeah. That's a question we can continue the conversation. Yeah. Uh, do you find yourself uh, as, Fantastic work, by the way. Thanks. Um, uh, as you formulate the research questions within the context of projects, do yeah. you find uh, that there are research questions that they need to persist beyond just one particular project? Absolutely. And how, do you, like, yeah. how do you try to open yeah. up some room for it? Well, first is about capturing research in practice. So the, the investment in a research query process or research infrastructure was really um, done with the hunch that the work that we do is going to translate to the next project, to the next project, to the next project. So when we, um, we, also, we also know that the first time we try something might be the only time, or it actually might be a new practice that translates to another situation. So it's our responsibility. We're accountable to our colleagues to actually capture. And we find there are topics, I see Christopher back there, there are topics that we have invested in for the past 11 years that are just persistent, right? And then there are ones that uh, maybe are more one-offs or ones that lasted for like three years, right? But we see translation across the entire office. And what I would say about that is the practices we thought, rituals and habits, practices that we thought were near future practices that we tested actually transform into normalized practices that require training and quality assurance and distribution and attention to how people take them up. That's also something we've learned. Okay, thank you.